Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about horseradish with Dr. Elizabeth Wally here on the show, but you know I can't do this by myself, folks. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Long time no see. Where have you been, Ken? I just... <laughs> I've been looking all over for you. I couldn't find you anywhere. How have you been, actually? You've been you've been jet setting, correct? I have, can't you tell I'm nice and tan? I, I, I can tell there's like <laughs> sand coming off of your beard. Um, there, where, you must have been somewhere tropical. I was there down in South Florida. So we had our National Association of County Agricultural Agents meeting at West Palm Beach. So I was there for five days learning about all kinds of stuff and then Took a vacation down in South Florida, hit up the Everglades, Biscayne National Park, uh, Cypress National Forest, all that fun stuff. So lots of time outside in Florida. You just went out there and just started capturing like pythons and boa constrictors, right? <laughs> no, my wife wouldn't let me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, okay. we wanted to try to find somewhere where you could or go on an iguana hunt or something like that, but <laughs> she, <laughs> she didn't want to. Well, you um before the show you were describing this uh dragon fruit farm that you stayed at it sounded like paradise so that that seemed pretty nice uh did you get any dragon fruit out of the deal we did get we did pick a couple um they were we were going to buy some but we had to leave early and didn't get it in time but we did we did get to pick a couple they were the red fleshed uh dragon fruit usually the stuff in the store you get is white fleshed but these were the red fleshed they were good well, and it, then it's and part of the the conference they did tours and went to a mango farm and bought way too much mango i didn't realize i mean this place grew like 40 50 different types of mango i just kind of assumed mango is mango but it's kind of like apples where you've got all these different varieties that taste different and and stuff and i don't know if i can ever eat store-bought mango again after going there not. No, no. I mean, there's, you can't go back. Um, I di Didn't you see the sign as you're leaving Florida, Ken, for the Florida Department of Agriculture saying you need to uh, stop and get your vehicle checked? So I hope you didn't have too many uh, uh, passengers. We <laughs> um, <laughs> might cut that part out. <laughs> I think, I think they were inspected first, so I should be ah. okay. Yeah, they're all pre-inspected. I like that. Yes. I like that. <laughs> we might not include that part in the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, speaking of plants that, well, I mean, I've never grown, and I think, you know, you've also not grown. Today, we're going to be talking about horseradish. So it's a completely new uh, crop, at least to you and me. So to, to talk about this, uh, we have brought on uh, Dr. Elizabeth Wally. She's a commercial ag educator with U of I Extension. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Well, it's great to be on again. Well, we are happy to have you here. Now, let me get your, your title correct here because it's commercial agriculture, but in fruit and vegetable production, correct? Yeah, I try to limit uh, my uh, exposure to corn and soybeans and wheat. Uh, <laughs> so I, I hang out with the fruits and vegetables and nut guys. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, it, it is a lot of fun <laughs> when we... Oh, and, and the horseradish. Don't forget them. Yes, they're, they're also in there. It's a lot of fun to see uh, Elizabeth get together with a lot of these different growers out there because you have such a good rapport with them. And they they really shoot it to you as it is. They don't like, they don't mince words about things, do they? No, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot of fun. So if you ever want to have a, a good dinner party, get Elizabeth with some of these uh, tree fruit growers or some of these horseradish growers, and it will be quite a conversation. It's always fun. So Elizabeth, <laughs> oh, I, I mean, what you do, I wish I could be kind of a fly on the wall half the time just to know, like, especially like talk about like grapes, peaches, any tree fruits really is just like so much knowledge out there. So yeah. We, we're happy to have you here for horseradish, though. Yeah, and I'm coming from, you know, the U.S. capital of horseradish, Collinsville. Collinsville, Illinois. Well, that, that that's good to know then, because really my first question is, having never grown this before, what is horseradish classified as? Do we call it a spice? Is it an herb? Is it a vegetable? Like what, Like, what is this thing? 
Well, horseradish is a, a member of the cabbage family. And so like, you know, the mustards, the cabbage, all of them, and, and horseradish just happens to have a root that has a lot of culinary um, desirable qualities. You know? Spunk, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think of uh, horseradish as more of a, a natural condiment. So, I mean, it is really made to enhance the flavor of food. So, I suppose technically you could call it an herb when you're eating it fresh, um, but you could call it a spice when you're eating it in a dried form too. So, um, and hence that's why I call it a natural condiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so you mentioned this already, but where is horseradish grown commercially? Well, I'll give you a little bit bigger picture here. Um, on the world level, um, it, it's primarily for food purposes grown in Europe, mainland Europe, um, and also the United States. Now for um, chemical use, um, we use that for ELISA test or you know, testing for virus and so forth. Uh, horseradish is a component of that. And a lot of that is grown in uh, Africa, um, South Africa specifically. Um, within the United States, it is grown in almost every state in the nation, including Alaska. Um, but the the largest producer of, of horseradish is Illinois, uh, followed by Wisconsin and then uh, California. So Illinois is the largest producer. And within Illinois, I will say that the majority of the horseradish growers are located where I'm at in uh, the Madison Monroe, St. Clair area. Does, so does that Southern climate, is that really useful for this crop? Um, you mentioned Alaska. so. We're okay doing this in northern Illinois too. Yeah, it is a it is a, a crop that's very tolerant of cold temperatures, so um, it's it's real amenable. Obviously, we're in the St. Louis area, so it'll take some heat too. Um, the reason it's here, though, is because immigrants, you know, their families, you know, in a hundred years ago, uh, grew horseradish and brought it when they immigrated to this country, and in the um, Mississippi River bottoms. Um, we just happen to have really nice light soils that are very productive and easier to dig horseradish. So across the board, it's just kind of a melding of the two, good location and people that had the skill set to grow it. I got you. Where I grew up, a lot of the immigrants, the German immigrants, I'll say, brought a lot of uh, taverns and churches. So that's uh, what grows mostly in my hometown. Yeah, definitely. It's <laughs> what you know. That's exactly. So. Um, if that is the, the commercial side of things where, you know, it has grown quite a bit in, in Illinois, uh, throughout the world, in the backyard garden, though, you know, is this something that a backyard gardener could get and, and, and easily grow? Um, I guess, is there a steep learning curve to growing horseradish? Well, um, not to me. Um, it's just not as common uh, for most people to have it included in their garden. But I would say that, you know, if we were talking about what its requirements are, the main requirement is that it requires well-drained soil. Um, it's usually planted in the very early spring. So it's one of the very first vegetables that you would put uh, in your garden if you're, you know, doing a first time planting. So as soon as the ground can be worked, um, it can be grown in almost as I say, any type of soil, as long as it's well-drained, but it really comes down to the digging <laughs> that the preference would be for a little bit lighter soil rather than heavy soil, because um, it can be a, a fairly large root system that you're digging. And so I would say that um, uh, if you're trying to dig horseradish in a really heavy soil, um, and if it happens to be dry when you're trying to dig it, then you're probably chopping the plant up a lo lot more than you really want to. It's no big deal. You're just dealing with pieces rather than, you know, the whole root system. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to say that um, if you add compost to a heavier soil to lighten it or to add the same compost to a sandy soil, because we have areas in the state are, that are really sandy, um, that will help with um, water holding uh, capacity. So compost would probably be my recommendation if you need to lighten or add water holding capacity to the soil. Okay. And I, I know like a lot of like post-construction residential soils, you have like two inches of stuff you can dig in and then you hit like a 
a pan, subsoil clay pan, and something yeah. like that. Does the the root kind of like a carrot? Does it like fork and or just it, like stunt pretty, it? It's pretty tough, and and it can work in you know it it can really grow. Um, but again, it's getting it out of the ground that is really more of the issue. Yeah, yeah, I I have spent many times digging carrots and potatoes and well, uh, frankly, ginger actually. And, and, uh, with growing ginger, the suggestion is to bury it deeper, kind of like asparagus, right? But you're not digging up an asparagus root here. You're digging up the ginger root or rhizome technically, right. but you got to go so deep. And then it just becomes so labor intensive. It's, it's almost not fun anymore. Yeah. With, you know, in horseradish, you, you might plant it relatively, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, relatively shallow, but by the time it's done growing and you're harvesting at the end of the season, you can easily be eight to 12 inches down, um, which can be some significant digging on your part. So you want to make sure that you've got some nice soil to dig in is, mm -hmm. is what my recommendation is. Yeah, like that. So I'm going to show my ignorance here on horseradish. Um, but if, if somebody wants to grow horseradish, um, what should they be looking for? Um, and I personally have never looked for it, but I've never really seen it for sale anywhere. Is this something where, you know, it would be like a, a soybean where you have short day, long day? Is there like garlic where there's different types of garlic that, you know, hard neck does better in Illinois than soft neck does? Um, you know, are there different types or what should people be looking for when they're, if they want to grow horseradish? Well, I'm going to kind of give you a wishy-washy answer. Uh, on this. Um, so there are many different cultivars of horseradish. And as you already mentioned, they all differ in, you know, how hot they are, how sweet they are, what their bitterness is, you know, how smooth the root is, what their yield potential. I mean, just across the board, they're all um, lots of different cultivars. But the vast majority of cultivars grown for commercial production are proprietary meaning that the industry itself has a breeding program and they internally support those cultivars and don't release them for general purchase. Having said all that, you can still go through mail order uh, catalogs or companies like Johnny's or um, Norse Farms or sometimes pronounced Nurse Farms um, who carry horseradish. And it's not the plant that you're buying, but you're buying a piece of root. So it's not very common to ever run across somebody who is growing a transplant, you know, and selling an actual plant. What you're buying is a root that's been, main, you know, harvested from the previous crop, held in cold storage, and then sold to whoever orders it. And so um, the root that you usually get is about the diameter of an adult index finger, and they're usually anywhere, I'm gonna say from eight to 12 inches long. So uh, you order your horseradish and you get, you know, a couple of, or maybe half a dozen, depending on how many you order, these unbranched straight root pieces. And that is the piece that you will go out into your garden in the early spring and you will plant them horizontally at a slight angle. And you're gonna put the head of the root at the higher angle or closer to the soil surface. And that's gonna become important later when I talk about creating that really big root. But anyway, um, we will plant it horizontally and then bury it. And so I liken it to think about a root laying on a pillow. And so because its little head is laying on a pillow, its head is higher than its foot. And so if you have you know, a question about which one is the head, usually the head you know, on overall length is the end that has a little bit bigger diameter because it's closer to the main part of the um, root system of the plant. So skinny end down, fatter end at the top, like it's laying on a little pillow. And so um, if you order um, horseradish, sometimes in the commercial, you know, retailers, mail order, they just sell it as horseradish and there's no cultivar designation. You just buy horseradish. But others will actually have designations and probably some of the more common cultivars that you're going to run across are things like Big Top or Swiss. So there are some cultivars that um, you might run across, but don't be surprised if you just see it advertised as horseradish. But it will be a root that you're buying and not a plant. So Elizabeth, for some reason, 
in my head, I had horseradish pegged as in the carrot family. I don't know why. I just, it was just like, that's how it's always been in my brain. But you mentioned brassica. Yes. I've grown turnips and kale, broccoli, all this stuff. And I know that there are certain pests that go after these. So when we're growing these horseradishes, is there, do we need to be watching out for these like cabbage worms and all that other things that I tend to afflict brassicas? Well, in this particular crop, I would say that, you know, um, I've probably seen a lot of the same pests that you see on, you know, the rest of its relatives. But the main one that will go after horseradish happens to be flea beetle, at least for us down here. Um, flea beetle is one that does enough leaf damage sometimes to justify um, doing some insecticide spray just because it, it chews up too much of the leaf uh, and infects you know, photosynthesis of the plant. But you will occasionally see, you know, some cabbage loopers on there chewing, but they're not the main pest of horseradish. Any diseases that we need to look out for with horseradish? You know, we do have, you know, just like cabbages um, and, and the other relatives, if I were to give you the whole list of possibilities, it would be big. I mean, it would, would be like... <laughs> Just like I don't any, want to grow this anymore. <laughs> you know, if, yeah, if, if I, you know, any plant that I list, if I list all the possibilities, it's like, well, I'm not growing that. Um, horseradish does have a soil-borne root disease complex um, that is quite common that causes um, what I'm going to describe as peppering of the root. So normally when we harvest a root and we cut it open, we want it to be nice and icy white. Um, but with this disease complex, it, you'll see this black peppering is how I'll describe it on the inside of the root. And when you grind it, 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 if it's really severe, it can cause some grain. So there's no toxicity problems to us to consume it. And it doesn't seem to affect the viability, like it doesn't kill the plant, but it just discolors the root. And so for, you know, a homeowner, if you know about that, you're okay with it. You know, you just know what caused that. But if you're going to the store and buying it, you know, you expect horseradish to be nice and white. And, um, you know, if you were to see a gray jar of horseradish in the grocery store, you, I don't know about that. So commercial growers are a lot more sensitive um, to that disorder probably than, than a homeowner uh, would be. Do, and do we need to keep weeds away from the base of the plant? Because I... I'm not that great at weeding around my turnips, but they seem to do, do okay. But since you're going to be digging around this, you probably want uh, the weeds away from the base of that plant. Yeah, I mean, you know, when we're talking about growing something for um, yield and quality, almost always, you know, we're going to say control the weeds um, on there. And horseradish is no different. We want to, you know, keep the competition down so that uh, all the resources are going to the plant and not to all the surrounding weeds. Would, would like mulch be a good thing to use around? Yeah, you plant? know, for a homeowner, you know, we wouldn't do this commercially, but for a homeowner, you know, whatever tactics, I mean, commercially, we have a number of herbicides that we use that normally homeowners would not use. And so homeowners, though, would be looking at other methodology, you know, and so if they're, you know, using mulch, you know, to suppress weeds, that works well. Uh, as well. And I wouldn't hesitate to tell people to, you know, get in there with a hoe and control it regularly. But if they've got something like mulch to suppress, that works too. All right. One thing I've always heard about horseradish that has made me hesitant to grow it uh, is that once you grow it, you're going to be stuck with it forever, i.e. it's hard to get rid of. Is that well, the case? Yes, it is. <laughs> and, and it has that quality because anything that you leave in the ground after harvesting down to the smallest root hair is capable of reproducing the plant. And so, you know, if you go in there and, um, you know, just dig a partial root system and leave something behind, you know, there's going to be some new germination. In fact, that's how they do production uh, in California, unlike us, we plant the crop annually. Um, in California, they just harvest and, and all the little pieces left over regenerate the crop. And so they'll grow the field for several years. And so California commercially grows like homeowners do. Um, they rely on leaving a piece behind so that you don't have to replant it. Uh, it just generates a new plant uh, every year. So um, that's good 
in the sense that if you like horseradish and you want to keep the patch going, that you do an incomplete harvest. But if you get tired of your horseradish and, and don't want that patch anymore, then you're going to have to step up your game of being a real thorough, like every time something comes up, you dig up that piece of root. Or if you're willing to use conventional herbicides, use something you know systemic like OFSA or 2,4-D. Those both will effectively uh, take out horseradish. And so make, making sure I understand. So for a homeowner here in Illinois, horseradish would be considered more like a perennial because we would be leaving probably root pieces behind in that soil. Right. Yes. Okay. Very good. But yeah, so commercially more annual in, in Illinois than in different Illinois, in others. Yes, it is considered an annual crop. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's good to know. So now I'm thinking, can maybe a good solution could be container growing? I don't know, Elizabeth, could we throw this in like a whiskey barrel and get a good root one year and not have to worry about yeah. getting this somewhere you know, we don't want it? about it is not a plant that is aggressive like spreading it just won't die it just <laughs> coming up uh is is the issue so the more if you spread the roots around they're going to germinate everywhere so you know if you if you want to be able to easily dump out you know a barrel of soil and you know be done with horseradish production then container growing would be good again same rules apply you want to have good drainage. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I know my plan for next year then. I'm going <laughs> to get some ginger roots or not ginger. Sorry. I got a lot. I got ginger, ginger on, the brain. on the brain. I do. I do. Uh, <laughs> and I can't, I dream about it. Um, we're going to get some horseradish roots, going to get those ordered, going to get a big container. I'm going to grow it next year in a container. I think that's where I'm going to go with because in it, Elizabeth Ken knows this people listening know this. My yard is to find sunshine is difficult in my yard. So to have a container where I might be able to move it, depending on where the sun's at in the sky that time of year, that's ideal for me. That's one of the best uses of con containers in my uh, estimation. Um, you know, if you've, if you've either have shade or you've created so much shade that you no longer have sun, um, containers are just a wonderful thing to be able to wheel them around wherever you want them to be. So now the all important question, now that I know I'm gonna do this next year, how am I going to know when to harvest this? Is there a cue that the plant gives? Well, there's a little word gimmick that we're, that I'm going to share with you. And so the growers always say that horseradish is harvested in the months with the letter R in it. So Write that's that down. September <laughs> through April. Whoa, really? So any any time in those months where the ground is not frozen, because it's almost impossible to dig frozen ground, it's not that the roots, you know, are no good. It's just that you can't dig when the ground's frozen. Um, you can be digging horseradish. And so um, I'm going to say whenever you need horseradish, um, dig it as you need it because it stores better in the ground than it does indoors. Interesting. So, you know, if you've got enough horseradish, go out and get it as you need it. Let that's why I leave uh, parsnips and carrots in the ground over winter and usually put a little hoop over it with some plastic or something to keep the snow off. So, hey, I got something else I can else to add to your patch. <laughs> yes, I can harvest in the winter. I love harvesting things in the winter. It's so much fun. If you were to try to store it indoors, um, what would the process for that be? Well, um, it depends on whether you are, are storing the roots or whether you're storing prepared product. Um, so if you're grinding it and, and setting it with vinegar, um, it has a different storage. So um, I will say that it is, you know, I've already said it's best to store it in the ground because that's the best place to store it for the longest time. If you store it in the refrigerator or freezer, um, it's, it's best to store it as a whole root because once you start grinding, it starts losing its qualities in terms of heat and flavor over time. And so it's that grinding process that does that. And so um, don't grind everything up all at one fell swoop. I would, I would hold some regular roots back and only grind what you know you can use. So if we're looking at it, um, I'm gonna say, uh, if you're storing it prepared, um, you want to keep it in the refrigerator or freezer. And in the refrigerator, um, you're probably looking at um, four to six weeks 
Uh, if you store it in the refrigerator, you're probably at least six months. So quite a bit longer storage in the freezer than refrigerator. Um, if you are um, storing the roots in the refrigerator, I'm going to say that um, you need to wash them um, and put them in a plastic bag. And you can probably store those um, for several months uh, in the refrigerator um, at regular refrigerator temperatures. But I would wash them and, and keep them in a plastic bag. So if you were to, to store these in the ground and forget about it, it'll re-sprout next year. Would you end up with just a progressively larger and larger root if you were just leave it? In no, the it, doesn't, it doesn't have a tendency to get bigger. Um, it, it's like any perennial plant. It, you know, it, it's, it stores, it stores enough to get through from winter to winter and, and kind of maintains that level. Mm -hmm. So it uses that energy that it's storing up in yeah. that root. Well, it uses energy it stored towards winter then to initiate that growth. So you see kind of a shrinking and up and up and down. Okay. So it might overall, you know, gradually increase, but it's not what you think where it turns out. Be, be the size of your arm. Yeah. Eventually. <laughs> well, I don't know. Sometimes I've, I've seen some pulled out of the ground there that size. Some, sometimes what they can accomplish in a year is amazing. So does, does horseradish, does it flower? Is there any reason why you have to worry about pollination with this? You know, that's one of the funny things that's in uh, literature. Um, a lot of the historical literature outright stated that horseradish did not produce seed. Um, they do flower. We don't usually see flowering because a lot of times they're harvested before they do flower. Um, and so it's quite lovely uh, when it's in bloom. Uh, it always catches my eye when I drive by a horseradish field and see it in full spectacular bloom. It's quite lovely. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the scent, if you get a um, bouquet of the flowers in your car with you when I bring them home it's almost overwhelming so they have a really sweet smell um, but what's been uh, interesting through research um, our our breeder at Southern Illinois University Dr. Alan Walter has determined that not all of them are compatible with each other so some are capable of, of pollinating another and some are not and so he's been doing um, some research on which one is able to be a seed parent or the mother and which ones are not. And that's part of the breeding program. So in fact, they are capable of producing seed if you know what are the appropriate, you know, parents to put together uh, on it. And so that is the number one reason that the crop is propagated vegetatively. It's easier and quicker and you maintain the overall genetics of, you know, plant with qualities that you like. It, and is this within that same lineage of um, mustard where it's like we have bred out specific traits like for the turnip, we've bred out that that root for Brussels sprouts, the sprout, like is it that same species just bred out? Is horseradish lumped in there or this, is it separate? Well, unlike, you know, like broccoli and, you know, kohlrabi and, and Brussels sprouts, which are all varieties of one another, the, this one is a distinct um, genus species different. So it, it's not in that group, but it's, it's definitely in the family. And they, in breeding, when we are breeding, we are looking for specific characteristics. And so I'm involved in, you know, being with the growers when they're evaluating new, new breeding, you know, lines. And so what they're looking at, and, and it's no different for homeowners, homeowners would want the same characteristics. We want to have a smooth exterior root. We don't want this big hairy root that holds on to dirt and requires a lot of peeling because a lot of the heat is in that outer skin. When you grind it, it really provides a lot of the heat. So we don't want to have to peel away that, you know, the flavors and the heat um, that are in the skin. We also, when we eat the horseradish, we want it to have, you know, a noticeable bite to it, like take your breath away heat. Um, because when you start grinding it, that starts dissipating rather quickly. But we also want it to have a really good flavor um, to it as well. And so I've had some that just like the front notes were just like super hot, but there was no flavor behind it at all. You've all probably had a, a pepper where you couldn't taste anything other than your mouth on fire. Other than it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Horseradish can be like that too. So they're trying to find things that you know, have that smooth root, but also good heat, good flavor, 
but they also, you know, because we're talking about in this particular case, commercial growers, they want a yield component to it as well. And so it, it, that's all well and fine, but if the roots are all skimpy and, you know, not productive, you know, and homeowners really want to have something, you know, that is worth their while too. So a yield component is, is what they're looking for in breeding, but those are probably the main components when they're breeding horseradish that they're looking for and disease susceptibility. You know, when I travel to uh, Europe, you see quite a bit of white rust, um, which is a problem over there um, that we don't have here. Mm -hmm. And uh, there has been in the 50s a breeding program to develop rust resistant, not GMO, natural selection um, of rust resistant. So all the horseradish that is grown in, in Illinois uh, tends to be white rust resistant, which is really nice not to have to deal with, uh, yeah. even for homeowners. So Elizabeth, for in my household, we don't grow horseradish, but we definitely use it. We eat it. Um, it's actually replaced mayonnaise in our refrigerator because I think actually, uh, Ken, it was on a trip to Florida early this year. We were in the car and we're making these flavorless sandwiches and we're like, we slathered on some horseradish sauce. We're like, oh, this is so good. And so we really made the switch then. So uh, that's how we use it. But Elizabeth, how, how do you use horseradish? Uh, do you have a preferred way or how is it prepared? You know, that's kind of, I decided that's a, a, a tricky question because I absolutely adore horseradish um, and there's really no form that I don't like, but I could probably talk about a few things that aren't usually thought about um, with horseradish. And so I'm going to say the best food that I've ever eaten in my entire life, and I'm not even saying horseradish food, I'm saying food, happened to be a creamed soup, a cream soup that was an apple horseradish base. Mm -hmm. And so when you ate it, it was definitely horseradish. And have you ever eaten something where your mouth just keeps saying, go, 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 go. And your stomach <laughs> oh, is yeah. like, okay, I've had enough. Mm -hmm. um, that's how this struck me. And it is still at the top of my list. And I'm still trying to figure out what this restaurant did to make this, this soup, but it was definitely an apple horseradish that was just delicious. And so I'm going to say that horseradish pairs really well with fruit. One of my, you mentioned, you know, uh, replacing mayonnaise. One of my favorite condiments is a cranberry horseradish mix. And I absolutely adore it on pork, like Wiener schnitzel or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I can just, just slather it on. Um, horseradish is excellent pairing with potatoes of anything, anything potato. You put it in mashed potatoes. If you season um, potato chip dip, um, not so common here in the States, but occasionally I see it. If you ever see uh, horseradish potato chips, get some because that's another one of those things that you definitely cannot eat just one. Um, they're absolutely delicious. Now, more traditionally, um, horseradish is you can shave it like a blizzard over the top of, you know, lunch meat or roast beef sandwiches. And it's just excellent. Um, and it is also as a prepared condiment, as you mentioned, Chris, um, it, it just really goes well um, with lots of different um, food, food groups, particularly pork and beef. I'm, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> so I'm gonna just say, yes, if you go to Arby's with me, the main mm -hmm. condiment that I get is- oh Arby's. yeah is is the horsey sauce that's I, right I, they can never give me enough either it's like no 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 yeah. uh two handfuls please yeah yes. it's it's dripping off when i'm eating it <laughs> yep yep I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm raking up anything that dripped off uh so i'll also share uh we've had roasted potatoes with like a gorgonzola horseradish cranberry topping to it oh my goodness yeah we Amazing. haven't gotten into the the cheese, horseradish going into cheese and Ooh. all those wonderful things too. It, it's, as I say, it is a, a beautifully natural condiment. It pairs well with lots of food and improves their flavor. Oh, that sounds, well, I think we need to stop there because I'm getting hungry. I still got a full day's work ahead of us. Uh, Ken, what are we going to do? We're going to have to, <laughs> we're going to take a little break for some snacks. Second lunch break. 
That's right. Second lunch break. Here we go. Like you, I can just roll down the down the street and pick up horseradish anytime I want. <laughs> Next year, I'll be able to do that too. There yes. you go. Yes. Well, um, Elizabeth, you in addition to horseradish being, you know, you know, Illinois being the top grower for that, Illinois is also top grower for another uh, fruit vegetable crop pumpkins and so you uh and also i'm, I'm assuming nathan johanning uh commercial ag educator is going to be hosting the pumpkin field day coming up is that correct yes nathan uh nathan is the lead on the illinois pumpkin field day and i'm 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 his helper i'll call myself that i'm his helper and picking up whatever he needs me to do but this year uh we're hosting it on september 1 and we are going to be at eckert's family orchard at their belleville location so uh Check out uh, all the uh, marketing and news releases that come out, but uh, head down this way to Belleville, which is, is in the St. Louis Metro East, if you're not familiar with the towns of uh, St. Louis, and it's to the uh, south. Very we will have, you know, we're going to have um, uh, variety trials and we'll have uh, some weed trials uh, for people to see and, and lots of people, uh, growers there to talk about how they produce pumpkins in the state. Yep, pumpkins are more than just jack o' lanterns. There are so many different kinds these days, and Especially it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, well, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Wally, thank you so much for being here today to talk about horseradish. I am super excited to to try this crop out next year. So, thank you for being here. Sure. Every time you're out, order horseradish. That way, they have to use up what they have and buy some more. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension. A special thank you to Ken Johnson for being our co-host uh, with us every single week. Ken, thank you for being here. Hi. Thanks for being here, too. Let's do this again sometime in the future. Oh, we will do this sometime in the future. We'll get our, our time machines and figure it out. I bet Ken's going to be talking to you next week, a uh, Garden Bite, a short episode. But then we will be back after that. More guests, more fun, exciting gardening topics. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing. <laughs>